Southern Africa is a snake paradise, but unfortunately not everyone loves snakes. A small, tightly woven group of snake experts works towards creating a brighter future for these highly misunderstood animals. Their work is driven by passion, with the goal to protect and educate the public about snakes. These are the snake heroes of Southern Africa. I grew up in, uh, in Durban and uh, had a few snake encounters as a kid, around five, six, seven years old. And uh, also spent some time on farms with relatives in places like Stella and Grootvlei and Armelua. And there were snake encounters there and it sort of intrigued me, but of course most of these snakes were killed on sight. I was walking with a friend of mine and I noticed on the corner of my eye a snake that was sitting on the grass just against the wall. And I remember walking and then thinking to myself, ooh, I've noticed the snake, but I'm not going to let my friend know about it because he's probably going to want to go and kill it. So we walked all the way home and uh, his mom or dad came and picked him up. And as soon as he was gone and I knew the snake would be safe, I returned to where the snake, where I'd seen it earlier. And it ended up being a dead house snake. Um, well, what I understand now, it was a, it was a house snake. Um, it was dead. Um, so yeah, it was as early as that, that I had sort of like a, a fascination for them. But I think when I really got into snakes was through a friend of mine in school at the age of about 13 or 14. He gave me a pet snake um, and that's when my interest really took off. Well, I was about nine years old. We were living in, in an area in Westville where we used to find a lot of snakes coming through the garden, mainly specifically spitting cobras, Mozambique spitting cobras. And uh, as kids, we'd grown up to be scared of snakes, uh, more, more scared than respectful, to be honest. And we had so many snakes in our garden in Westville that um, it was terrifying. The dogs got spat at by cobras, and uh, we eventually called upon a neighbor to come and catch his snakes. He was a young guy, a bit younger than, or a bit older than me, rather. And he would come in and catch his snakes. And we, we started learning a bit about them. We learned that the spitting cobras are, are, are quite dangerous, quite bad news guys. But we also had a lot of house snakes, herald snakes, uh, brown water snakes that came through the garden. And this chap would teach us, me and my two sisters, to teach us everything that, that he could about these snakes. So from the age of nine, I was a little kid in school that was the only guy that knew anything about snakes. And if a snake popped up at school, they'd come and call on this little nine or 10 year old boy to come and catch them. So it's been a, been a fairly long interest. So I got my first brown house snake when I was eight years old. So that's um, almost 50 years ago. And I've um, been interested in snakes ever since then. So it just shows you the impact that, that having a pet snake can have on uh, your future, if you, if you will. My uh, parents got this property where we are now, a plot in Dipsluit, about 35 kilometers north of Johannesburg, and we moved here. Now, in 1963, there was nothing here. It was like living out in the felt. And we just found snakes, and all the snakes were killed. And then I would ask my parents all the questions I could think of. What snake is this? What does it eat? Is this a male or a female snake? And they couldn't answer a single question. The only answer they had for me is, we don't know. And so I started reading about snakes, became absolutely fascinated with the subject. Two years later, in 1965, I started pleading with my parents to allow me to catch snakes. So eventually they relented, gave me permission, and I started catching snakes. So I've been catching now since 1965. Uh, my first accident with the snake was in 67. I was spat in the left eye by a runkles. In that same year, in 67, uh, I had collected a number of runkles and I started doing venom extraction from runkles. My interest in snakes started when I was about three years old after watching Steve and the Crocodile Hunter. Um, and then soon after that, uh, we discovered a house snake in the garage that my dogs were barking at. And we caught that and from then on, that sparked the passion. I was born without a hip and I had club feet, so I couldn't run and play with fluffy dogs and stuff like that. And snakes used to stay with me. So what I did then is I thought that I could help snakes by preserving them and just keeping their natural habitats in order and making sure that one day when I have children, they have a snake to look at and all of them aren't extinct. During my pretty much standard five to matric years, I did a lot of work at the Johannesburg Zoo um, as a volunteer, as a kid, you know, on the weekends. 
and I managed to worm my way into the reptile department or division you know, of, of the Johannesburg Zoo. I had a general interest in any moving creature at that stage. Still very young. My folks moved house in Johannesburg. Long story short, our new neighbor, son, worked at the Transvaal Snake Park in Midrand. The good old TSP, what we used to call in those days. And um, he naturally had a a room in the house full of snakes. Right, I started being interested in snakes and reptiles when I was about 12 years old. Um, some dogs had killed off my guinea pigs and my dad got me something which he thought that uh, would be safer, it would be in the house and would be very interesting for me to look after and I got my first egg eater. And um, shortly after that I started talking to people about snakes and that's when I realized that I don't really know very much about snakes and there are very few books at that stage that there were about snakes. I guess when I was about five, um, it uh, wasn't an entirely nice experience but I had saw, I'd seen a snake uh, get killed and I was just fascinated at how this animal was staying moving without its head and I didn't really know what was going on and for me that was just something completely different and I felt very very sorry for the animal, but I wanted to understand more about it. Well, I grew up with snakes uh, around the house um, and obviously at the park itself. So from a very early age, learned how to interact with them. Um, I was never allowed to touch any venomous species until the age of 18. Um, so they were always around and always part of my life. So the first Serious capture at about the age of seven was a brown house snake down in, in Woodlands in, in, in Durban. And um, I got into a container. It was striking out quite voraciously. Um, my mom saw it and actually had to kill the snake. She said, no ways I'm keeping this. Kill the snake. Well, the first venomous snake I caught was a gnat adder um, at a holiday resort. Crawled over my dad's friend's foot. Um, the first venomous snake I kept, that was probably also a gnat adder. Um, and then I actually kept a spitting cobra when I was also about 16, 17 that I caught in the, in the prison, one of the prison guards homes. And it was just a little baby. I kept it for a few days out of interest and then released it. It started when I was 13 or 14 years old. It was through a friend of mine that um, kept snakes. And when I went to his place, I was always very intrigued. We always sit in his bedroom and he had some tanks set up in the, in the room. And yeah, um, I was just quite fascinated. I'd never liked snakes before that. Um, and yeah, just something about looking at those snakes in those cages and that just intrigued me. And then one of my birthdays, he gave me a brown house snake for a pet and that was that, the bug had bitten. I don't think it's a specific species of snake that really sparked the interest. It's really, I think my interest revolves around the biology of snakes. Snakes are are such adapted animals to the environment. They are so bizarre in so many different ways. Um, and they are so new, unique in comparison to other animals that it really, I mean, you just get captured by the biology of these animals. And I think that that's what's done it for me. The snake that sparked my interest was probably the brown house snake that I caught, the first house snake that I caught, um, but also seen those Australian snakes on TV. One of the first snake species I was actually introduced to is the African egg eater. And the reason for this is, is they do not have teeth in their mouth, so they're not capable of actually inflicting a bite with mechanical damage. And what I can remember about the snake was is when I was shown it, this impressive display where the scales actually rub together and the snake is all moving around and a lot of activity and the mouth is open and they're striking left, right and centre. But something which I noticed was as soon as I put my hand in front of that snake's mouth, he would actually shoot off to the left, to the right, up, down, but he actually never came into physical contact with my hand. And that's something that stuck with me throughout my life. A few years later, we've actually got some what, what they call saw scale vipers from the genus Echus. 
and the genus Echus has a similar display, threat display to an African egg eater where they actually, they call them a saw scale viper because they actually rub the scales together. It sounds exactly like an egg eater and it looks very similar to an egg eater but the difference is it's got highly toxic venom and these are actually responsible for biting and killing more people in Africa than any other species. And in West Africa alone, they cause tremendous amounts of human suffering. And it's a small snake, relatively small, around 30 to possibly 60 centimeters in length. And they occur in every environment in West Africa and they're responsible for biting numerous people each year. When I started keeping snakes, the first snake that I ever kept was an egg eater, which was a very interesting snake to keep and is very unusual and very South African. And trying to learn more about egg eaters was difficult because very few people were actually keeping or breeding egg eaters. And then I went on a school camp when I was in about standard seven, which is now grade nine, and I caught a night adder. And uh, this was the first venomous snake that I'd ever seen, the first one I'd ever caught. I brought it home and I was feeding it frogs and toads, which is its diet. And I realized that the way it was killing its prey was different to what I would have expected. And that piqued my interest in snake venoms. And those two snakes are actually, even though they look very similar and people confuse the two, those are the two that got me started on reptiles. The response from my, my mom wasn't good on keeping snakes. She was not mad about that. My dad was a lot more tolerant. Um, so most of the, as a kid, as a school kid, most of the snakes that I kept in enclosures were sort of quite tender style. They were sort of kept in cages without them really knowing what I was doing. And the same with visits to farms. If I went into the field and got stuff, I had to sort of sneak everything back. And the long drive back to Durban, I had to hide the snakes in the car. My family's reaction on the first snake I caught was absolute horror. I showed my price capture, a little red lip herald to them. And uh, the first question they had is, is this a dangerous snake? I said, it's not. They started bombarding me with their questions, which I could answer because of all my reading and studying on snakes. And so um, they then reluctantly said that I could keep it. I didn't have any snake cages. We just had um, empty paint drums. I took a, a 25 liter paint drum, put some soil in the bottom, planted some nice grass for the snake to live in. And I kept the snake there for a few days because one night the snake used the grass to climb out of the tin and it was gone. <laughs> so it was the first snake I caught for, so the first snake that escaped. Snakes are excellent escape artists. I think, I think my father in those days, he was still alive in those days, he was about the only one who supported me. Um, the rest of my family members thought I was a bit loony. And even today my, my kids are not fond of snakes, they don't rescue snakes. Um, but they've been supportive in the sense that my husband, although he won't touch a snake with his bare hands, he will attend every snake bite, call out with me, uh, he goes to the hospitals, he helps me treat snake bite victims. So I think they tolerate it um, and they understand my passion and they've just become used to the fact that this is something that I'm very, very passionate about. Um, so they do support, but they don't necessarily um, assist. When I started catching snakes, my parents reacted pretty well, actually. Uh, my mum was very accepting and she let me keep venomous and non-venomous snakes in the house. Okay, I didn't keep venomous snakes from when I was little, it was in my later teen years. But yeah, they were very accommodating with that. So initially, I was told not to catch or handle or pester or get near any snakes, just because I think that's the, that's the right way to, for a parent to react initially just to protect the kid from doing something stupid. And, but what was really cool then was my mom took me, got me a library card and took me to the library, the local library back in the day. There was no such thing as internet back then. And I was then able to read all the books that I could on, on snakes and reptiles. And I did, I read every single one in the library and then eventually started taking them out again because there were so few. And that really helped me gain a, you know, foster my, my, my initial curiosity and gain some, some good understanding about snakes, but they were mostly about exotic snakes. There wasn't, re there wasn't really anything about our local snakes. And then later on in life, um, my mom remarried um, a man called Peter Snayman, who was the guy who that uh, set the world record for snake sitting in Hyderpiers Put um, Snake Park many years back. And then I had the opportunity to to follow my dream of snakes because he was um, an avid amateur herpetologist and gave me the opportunity to, to you know, 
run around in the bush with him and actually learn a lot from him about how to how to find snakes, how to catch snakes, and and just just really was wonderful in the sense that it it nurtured my my initial curiosity and steered it in the I think which was the the correct way. When I was really young, um, I had an aunt who was a professor of biology at at Natal University, and so I had a lot of interaction with her, and I think that she probably mediated the relationship between me and my snakes and my parents because um, clearly at the beginning my mother wasn't really happy that I was keeping snakes because at that time it was an unusual activity. Lots of people keep pets as, uh, snakes as pets nowadays but, but in those days it was quite unusual and um, a lot of people thought really bizarre. I was quite lucky I had a family who were very wildlife orientated so for me to be keeping snakes wasn't much of a problem. And um, way back when, this is going back more than 45 years ago, uh, not very many people knew much about snakes and venoms and they thought if you get bitten, you just go to hospital. So when I was, before I even left school, I had a collection at home in my bedroom, which included things like vine snakes, boomslung, I had rattlesnakes, I had all sorts of stuff. And we never thought of the consequences of what would happen if someone got bitten because it was as simple as you get bitten, you go to hospital and they'll fix you. My family reacted on a weird way. My mom first didn't want to say yes, but after nagging on her for a really long time, at the age of nine, she said, I can go fully on with it. Maybe one day open a snake park and start re re relocating snakes and releasing them in our area. When I was a kid, there were very few of us that actually knew anything about snakes, very few of us that were interested in snakes. I can mention a few names that were my mentors. There were guys like uh, Neville Hawkey, Wayne Evans, the Smorenberg brothers who I never met but knew of, uh, Clyde Farr, Russell Blackney. Uh, sure, there were a handful of people in Durban. Then there was the Transvaal Snake Park people like Dave Morgan, uh, Graham Tomset. These are names that you hear of and, and you, you don't really know very well, but you eventually meet them one day and they're, they're idols. But this is going back now, sure, to the mid 80s, early 90s. So it's a fairly long time. And since then, the interest has grown. The first book I ever bought, though, probably one of the best starting points in my life was from an author called Johan Marais. And that book is so well thumbed and torn now. Um, so th those are a few of the names that, that popped up when I was a kid. The sad part is that um, we didn't really have any anyone that we looked up to when it came to teaching us about snakes or sharing information. And the only person that I had access to was Ray Parker, uh, the, uh, the owner of Simmons Snake Park on the beachfront in Durban. And Ray was an accountant, he wasn't really a herpetologist, and he was also an absolute introvert. So if you arrived at the snake park with a, with a snake for identification, he would halfway appear from behind the door and uh, volunteer as little information as possible to get rid of you because he didn't like speaking to people. So I grew up in Durban and I used to go down to uh, Fitzsimmons Snake Park um, on the beachfront regularly. And at that time, uh, Ray Parker was the owner and, and also the manager of the snake park. And I just remember him in his white lab coat and, and so on. And he was one of the few experts at that time that I could go and speak to about snakes and would have a better understanding about snakes because remember in that time there weren't any general field guides available for reptiles. Um, we live in a very different area now where information is very easily available but in those days you really had to go and seek out the expertise. As a child the only books that were around were written by uh, Fitzsimons who used to work at the Transvaal Museum. So I studied his books intensely and I also got to meet Mr. Wolf Harker who was working at the museum. And we spent many, many hours, me as a child, him as an adult, and he was explaining to me about snakes and he used all these massive scientific names which I didn't know and I just nod my head as if I knew what, I was, what he was talking about and go home and, and look this up. And that's how I actually started learning more about snakes and learning about the scientific names or the Latin names and getting interested in the um, more the taxonomical side of reptiles and not just putting them in a cage and feeding them. Yeah, I remember Fitzsimmons Snake Park based on the beachfront in Durban. Uh, used to visit there as, as a child along with Transvaal Snake Park and uh, you look at these guys and I had a, already had a love for the snakes at the time and I just wanted to, do, I wanted to do, be these guys, I wanted to work with them, I wanted to do, work with snakes all the time. And um, the guy that was running the snake park at that time in the late 80s was a guy called Clyde Farr 
Um, he was dubbed the Durban Mamba Man. And I thought, I, I just want to be that guy. He's, he's so cool. Uh, and as soon as I could, at the age of 16, or just before 16, actually, I went and approached them for a job, and I was able to, to, to get a job at this at the snake park. And the amazing thing about the snake park is it sees so many different people. It sees people like me who are love snakes and we're fascinated by snakes and then you get the people there who are absolutely terrified and repulsed by snakes and you see the looks on their faces they've paid a fee to come through the door and they are it's almost like they're in a in a horror movie they are terrified so the snake park sees everyone and it I think everyone leaves there with a different experience of it some people are still horrified some people have learned a little bit and the basis of having a park like that is it taught people something about something they wanted to know about. Whether they were terrified or, or interested, it taught them something. Fritz Muller owned the park at the time. In Transvaal Snake Park, there was, oh, there was a bundle of names. Dave Morgan, I'm trying to think, Rod Patterson. There were names that, that, you, that you heard of and you wanted to meet them. And when you did meet them, Richard Boycott. Um, there were names that you, you just wanted to meet these guys and be them and, and see and know what they were about. It was quite cool. So when we um, were living out here, in Deep Slurt, we had uh, very little financial means. Although we were only 15 kilometers away from the Transvaal Snake Park, uh, we just couldn't get there. So all my catching experience used to be under the category of uh, trial and error, sometimes more errors. And uh, slowly, slowly, I kind of built up more expertise. One day, a man rocked up at our farm. We were breeding rabbits. This man was looking for rabbits. So my parents asked him, what do you want to do with these rabbits? No, he needs them to feed his pythons. He's got a snake park at a Harabiaspore Dam. And that's when I met Jack Seal. Well, my father had an interest in animals and reptiles. And at that stage, uh, he was actually living in Pretoria and got involved at that stage with the Transvaal Natural History Museum. And at that point, again, there was very little information regarding reptiles in Southern Africa. So as a young child, he used to go and volunteer there and help out with the wet collection and just generally, I think, possibly make a nuisance of himself at, the, at that uh, institute. And this is where his love for these animals actually occurred. And um, they would go out on expeditions and he absolutely enjoyed this. And this is, I think, where I get my, my interest in it from. It's just. When you get into something and there's so little information known and you read articles and look at magazines and books and journals and you start seeing how much information we're actually missing, it's actually very interesting. Jack Seal started the Harbis Bodam Snake Park, I think it was early to mid 1960s. When I first visited that snake park, um, it had just a dozen cages. Uh, there was no ticket office. You just paid your 10 cents to Jack and uh, Jack was sweeping the uh, steps of the snake park. So he was everything there. Ticket office, snake demonstrator, everything. Um, that park has grown over the years. It's now a, probably one of the largest private zoos in Southern Africa. Jack had um, tremendous experience with snakes and snake bites. Um, one of the snake bites that he had in 1977 was a black mamba bite. Uh, he self-injected him with antivenom, five ampules, while he waited for the ambulance. The ambulance picked him up, took him to hospital. When he arrived at the hospital, he said, um, I've already taken antivenom, I want you to ventilate me for this snake bite, because that's what a mamba venom does, it paralyzes the diaphragm. The doctor then placed him on ventilation, and they eventually had to ventilate him for seven days before the diaphragm started kicking in and working again. Um, from that, the doctors had tremendous um, learning experience. They never knew that you could use ventilation to treat snake bites. Uh, so Jack asked them to do that for him and it proved to be very effective treatment for neurotoxic snake bites. My dad started the Horribes Bodem Snake and Animal Park and um, us finished school and studied marketing and business management and decided well I love animals and I specifically like reptiles and the reason is, is at that stage there was not much known about them. Um, generally they were feared and vilified and people would 
terrified of him. There was nobody in Swaziland that could be my mentor except for Richard Boycott. Um, he is a, uh, uh, he was a game warden and knew a little bit about snakes um, and helped me when I set up my reptile park. But there was nobody in Swaziland. This is why I became so involved with rescuing snakes because there was nobody else. Um, Mike Perry was my mentor for many years. He taught me, but I didn't have anybody. I was finger alone in those days. The snake expert I looked up to was definitely Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. Just his passion and enthusiasm for snakes and the way he worked with them, that's what really inspired me. The first one is the father of African herpetology, in my opinion, and that is uh, Dr. Donald Broadley. And then, of course, uh, Bill Branch, who was just so instrumental in, in making herpetology more accessible to the people in South Africa because of his wonderful books that he produced. And then the third person would be Johan Maré because of his incredible uh, knowledge and the way that he helped so many people to understand snakes better and through his books and also through the training that he, he provides. My first mentor was Johan Maré because I learned reading from his books and that's where my knowledge started growing. At the age of nine, my mom saw an advertisement that told everybody that they can go do a handling course in Clarksdorp. And everybody told my mom that I can't go because I have to be 18 and older. And there was this one guy, Ashley Dotkins, and he told my mom, it's fine, I can come, but I'm going to handle harmless. And the day I got 90, 93% for the test, and at the end of the day, he actually allowed me to handle a puff at her. So that's who I want to say thank you to because that's really where everything started. And then I did my course at the age of 11 and at the age of 10 at Johan Mare. That course also gave me a lot of information about snakes bites and just the basics of what to do when encountering snakes and how to handle them. And at the age of 12, I did my first course with a mamba. It was a green mamba. I did it at Neville Vorm Runs in KZN at its snake park. Right, I think probably one of the best childhood memories I have is when Jack Seal one day asked me to supply him with venom, with snake venom. Now, at that point in time, I had a number of wrinkles and uh, he had received a order from Germany for wrinkles venom. So he asked me if I could supply him with a venom. I was over the moon. That is really what I wanted to do. And so I proceeded to extract the venom from my group of wrinkles. And very soon I had the venom and I delivered it to him. And he was highly impressed. He said, this is excellent quality venom. And uh, I was very chuffed. Well, as growing up as a kid, I always had snakes around. And uh, we've always been su well supervised with the snakes, but we had interaction with the snakes, non-venomous species. So you get to learn how to handle them correctly, make sure that you are taking care of that specific snake in a, in a certain way which doesn't lead to injury and just generally interacting with snakes. From the age of 18 then we learned how to actually handle venomous snakes and we interacted with them. So I've been doing this now for about uh, 24 years now and uh, have had great fun. Um, there's still so much to learn about snakes, so little is actually known. Um, the number of species of snakes which are being found each year is increasing. Now with uh, genetic testing, DNA testing, we're finding more and more snake species. Where we thought of one just large group of snakes has now turned out to be a, a number of different species, different venoms. Um, so it's very interesting and very exciting. And also, uh, up until the 19, late 1990s, very little was known about uh, medicine in snakes. Veterinary medicine basically covered large herbivores, cows, horses, sheep and goats. Very little was known about exotic animal medicine in, in reptiles. So that's also been a very interesting thing that has now taken place in the last few years. So it, it's when I started there was very little known and nowadays there's more and more information and universities now are actually subsidizing special units now which are investigating just venoms and the taxonomy of snakes and stuff like that whereas in the last 20 years before that there was none of this research there wasn't an interest. 
we'd had a spitting cobra come through our garden one day and it spat at our dogs and uh, we, we couldn't find it. it. It disappeared somewhere in the garden. And the following day, I was replacing some plant pots on a, on a retaining wall that had been knocked off during our search for this cobra. And as I picked up one of the plant pots and, and put it on the wall, I looked up into a bush and directly in front of my face, coiled around a little reed, was this little spitting cobra, probably about 40 or 50 centimeters long, tiny little baby one. And it just sat there, looked at me. I looked at it. I don't know why it didn't spit at me or spray its venom at me. It just looked at me and I turned and I screamed and I ran. That, that's my most memorable. I don't know if that's a good or a bad memory, but that's a memory from my childhood. My best memories of, of snakes when I was a child, I think probably it was getting that first brown house snake. Just the amazement of this animal, just so different from anything I had met before. Um, and in those days, we didn't have exotic species in the country and so on. And probably if I'm talking about the biology again, I don't know if I've got specific instances. I remember back in those days, my parents used to allow me to go snake catching on my own in the felt um, when I was sort of 10 or 12 years old. And I'd come across snakes, I'd dig up old termitaria and find snakes there and I'd never let my kids do that nowadays just looking at the danger factor. Um, but I think that those days out in the field, on my own, learning about snakes and their natural environment, I think as a, as a group of experiences, that, that would be my fondest memories. I, I, I was never passionate about snakes when I was growing up. I was taught that no animal should be killed and my mother was very much one of those that um, taught us to respect nature. So we would never kill any snakes, but I was not aware of um, snakes as such from an early child. Very much or very often the people who were involved with snakes grew up with the passion and grew up learning about snakes. I didn't, I, I was in my late thirties when I first learned about snakes. So I was very much a late bloomer. Um, so my memories of snakes, in, in, it was just finding them in the garden. Um, but no, I didn't go to bed reading books about snakes or the conservation of, of snakes at all. I'm one of the odd ones, I think. My best childhood memory uh, would probably be this first snake that I ever got, which was a common egg eater, because this is what got me started with snakes. And because they have no teeth, they were very easy to handle. And I could show them to people and I could let other people touch them, knowing full well that they won't get injured. And as a result, more and more people got to like snakes because they'd now touched a snake. And I believe that if, if you've touched a snake, the snake has touched you. And the next time you see it, instead of grabbing a spade, you're gonna grab a camera. So I like the idea that people can actually physically touch snakes and realize that they're not the slimy, horrible creatures they thought they were. And once they've touched them, it definitely changes their attitude towards reptiles. One of my most memorable snake catching experiences when I was a child was when I was about seven years old, we, my mom spotted a huge spotted bush snake in the garden, which is harmless. Um, and I spent an hour trying to get it out of the shrub and that it crawled into a hibiscus shrub. Because uh, at first I was trying to grab it, then I lost it. And then I went and grabbed a camping chair and I sat in front of that bush for an hour waiting. Because, you know, when you're a kid, you just want to catch everything. And eventually after an hour, I saw a bit of movement and um, I chased it out the shrub, ran after it, grabbed the tail and latched, it turned around and latched onto my hand. And I got such a fright, I dropped it and that was it. I didn't catch it again. So all that time, um, I suppose it didn't pay off, but actually I learned a lesson, you know, patience. I learned about patience there on that day. We were staying on a farm just outside Polokwane at the time and people in the area had gotten to know that I was quite keen on snakes and I had the ability to, to, to catch them. So I got a call from a person who had a little sheep farm close to us uh, saying that they had this big cobra that they wanted removed. They didn't want to kill it. And so I raced over there with my motorbike and um, I found this, uh, this snouted cobra, but it wasn't a normal snouted cobra like we, we used to there because it was well over two meters. And I had arrived there without, in, the, in my haste, without any hook stick or any, anything to work with this animal. And I immediately just grabbed this animal and spent the next 
I don't know, it, must, it felt like ages, but it must have been quite a few minutes just wrestling with this big animal um, until it got tired enough so that I could pin it uh, behind the head. And so I had this big snake behind the head and um, it was just an absolute, I think it was ended up being two, two, two meters and 40 centimeters or something like that. And it was just so, so wild, but then I had no ways to get on my motorbike and drive back home. So I had to walk back home with the snake in my hand and uh, we measured it quite nicely and um, it was, it was quite, a, quite a big deal. So the, a reporter came out and took a photo of me with the snake and then uh, we safely released it. So that was when I was about 14 or 15. I had left in a very big rush and I, I didn't take the, the, any of my equipment or any of the bags with and stupidly but then when I saw the snake there was no chance to to suddenly look for other stuff so I just basically grabbed it and once I'd pinned it I thought oh, the easiest would be just to walk back home so it was only about a about a 3k walk but I walked like that with the snake necked all, all the way home and then uh, put it in a bag and then measured it from there. Well that concludes episode one of Snake Heroes. In the next episode, we're going to be hearing our Snake Heroes stories from the past, as well as what projects they are currently working on.